Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Another look at how to address crime and criminal justice in Memphis tonight on Behind the Headlines. <laughs> with the Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Chase Carlisle from the Memphis City Council. Thanks for being here again. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Along with Ben Adams, chair of the Memphis Shelby County Crime Commission. Thank you for being here. Along with Bill Drees, reporter with the Daily Memphian. We, uh, this is it, it, obviously in, in, in no small part a, a kind of reaction to the, the, I mean, I think it's fair to say a collective trauma that the city and the whole community has gone through with the mass shooting, with um, the abduction and killing of Eliza Fletcher with a series of, you know, high profile killings of, of, uh, of Ann Nelson, a community advocate was killed a month ago. Um, the Reverend Arturo Eason Williams killed um, uh, two months ago in July. And I, we did a show last week that we had lined up many months earlier with a lot of cr criminal justice uh, reform folks. Um, we had um, the uh, Ayanna Watkins from MICA. We had Josh Pickler from Just City, Cardell Oren from Stanford Children with, um, a particular point of view about long-term investments, and people can see that show. It's on WKNO.org, or you can download the podcast. And and uh, but we also want to get a, another point of view. Not that you all, all the group of you all disagree on everything. I don't want to set it up that way. But um, crime is heavy on everyone's minds. It has been for quite some time. We've done uh, a series of articles and really ramped up the amount of coverage of crime and solutions and problems at the Daily Memphian. And Bill and I have interviewed, I think, probably 20 different uh, people in the criminal justice world, elected, appointed, and so on officials over the last year plus. So with that in mind, I mean, um, what can be done? What can be done? I'll start with you, Chase. I mean, what? And I'll, it's the same question I asked the folks um, last week. There are a lot of agreement about long-term solutions, but there's a lot of concern about what can be done today, tonight, to make people safer. Yeah, I think I think you make a great point. I think you're going to find that we we all agree that we want a better Memphis, and and we want it um, today, and we want it to be a lasting better Memphis. Um, I think it's, it's simply to say that right now when people feel like they are under attack, under duress, scared to go on a walk, scared to be out in parks, scared to just live their lives, uh, you know, as, as Americans and Memphians, um, the simplest thing to do is have a show of presence. I mean, you could use the term force, but people need to feel like there is a, a public safety officer that can get to them or can protect them or can be present, um, you know, in and around their neighborhoods. Uh, and, and our public assets. And I, and I think that's a very simple thing to do. And then the second thing, and, and this is the one thing, we're not talking about broken window policing, but when you look at, at major cities that have had decreases in violent crime in, in near terms, it typically is arrest and convictions. And so our officers are arresting people. We need to ensure that violent criminals in particular are being convicted and put away. I mean, all the, the crimes I mentioned, as people have read and seen, involve people who had had repeat offenses and an and escalating path of repeat ex uh, offenses. Ben, um, if you would quickly, what, what is Memphis Shelby Crime Commission? Because people aren't necessarily familiar. Sure. And then, you're, again, your answer to that same question. What can be done in the short term, in the near term today, to address crime? Sure. So the, the Crime Commission is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. We have 50 board members, half of whom are public officials, uh, law enforcement, mayors, that type of thing. The other half are business leaders, community leaders, folks that are involved with some of our strategies, nonprofit organizations and whatnot. And so the first thing is everybody wants to know what's the plan. Well, that's what the Crime Commission does. We adopted a 20-point plan in January, unanimously adopted by those 50 board members. And there's a combination of prevention, intervention, enforcement strategies in there. Now, is that everything that we need to do? No. You know, recent, the recent events like the rape kits and some of the truancy arguments, we got we to look at some other things. But the main thing we need to do is work the plan. We have to have the will in this county to do the things we all need to do. And that's not just resources, that's execution, follow-up, holding folks accountable. Let me bring in Bill. 
There has been some discussion about the Crime Commission facilitating a, a, a new discussion about this, one that might go beyond the plan, one that might get into things like, like the school system and, and, and its efforts. Uh, what do you think about that as chairman of the board there? Well, I think we should continue to update our plan and to add things to it. And we have to work with the various people that are accountable for all of these things. I mean, there's a lot of work to do, for example, with the county commission because of we have a whole new juvenile court uh, group, and this is a good time to really rethink how we're doing uh, juvenile court, what we're doing in terms of intervention. You know, our, our, our remedies for uh, juveniles that are committing violent acts are pretty limited, and we really need a much more robust program. You know, Youth Villages Memphis Allies has agreed to help. We need funding for that. We need other funding for more caseworkers, more follow-up, more intervention, working with families is just one example. We've, we've talked about the impact that these recent crimes have, have had on the community, and I'm wondering if we've also had an impact, if there's also been a sea change with changes in juvenile court judge and changes in the district attorney general's office. Is that what's driving some of this as well? Oh, I don't think that's what's driving any of the of the violent crime. No, I think this is sort of a no. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean the calls the calls to take a second look at at the strategies and and things like that. I think there's, that's coming on both sides. It's coming on say the right because people are a little bit afraid of the changes, and it's coming on the left because people want some reforms. But you know, going back to what the, the last week's program. Uh, it's not an either or proposition. Of course we need to deal with the root causes of crime, which is poverty. Memphis is never going to reach its potential as a city if we don't have more citizens reach their potential. And that involves, in large measure, reducing uh, the cycle of poverty. But, you know, we've got immediate problems. We've got people that are afraid to go get gas and go to the grocery store. We've got businesses that are thinking about expanding here and may not. We have businesses that are thinking about coming here and may not. We have I got a call from uh, one of the board members, University of Memphis. They're getting calls from parents threatening to pull their kids out of college here. You know that happened at Rhodes last year. So there are immediate consequences so that folks like Chase and law enforcement leaders uh, and others have really got to take action. Mm -hmm. and Councilman, the discussion last, last week, um, while, while, while the discussion went around, well, it can't be either or, the same, same point that, that you just made. Um, some of the comments last week on the show were that, well, you have to give the long-term view a, a chance to, to work here. What do you think about that? I couldn't agree more. I mean, we are doing those things. I, I've been in city government for a grand total of two and a half years. It's not a nimble organization. It's a multi-billion dollar, 8,000 employee uh, organization. I don't know an organization of that size that can turn on a dime instantaneously. It's just not a feasible thing to say, and it becomes a political narrative and talking point for those that want change and are, and are gonna seek it any way without really understanding the mechanics of how it works. Things like Transit Vision. I've spent two and a half years um, working behind the scenes with Doug McGowan and, and on Transit Vision. Now we have Transit Vision. We're giving $6 million a year to pre-K. We are, our libraries have gone from open four days a week to six days a week. We've got employed, we employed 2,600 youth in the summertime. So we are making advances and we all want them to happen faster. But again, governments are not nimble organizations that can just turn on a dime. And I just add one more thing, that public safety is so important to the citizens of Memphis that they voted to raise their own taxes um, you know, in, the, in the 2019 election cycle. And the good news about that is, is it shows that they take safety very seriously as their number one priority, but it's also allowed us to make, the, make those investments in the general fund budget by utilizing those dollars to supplement certain things so that we can expand resources for the community. At, at the last council meeting, uh, council member Rhonda Logan had a resolution that was a general call to, to the state to, to help improve the presence of law enforcement here. You added an amendment to that, a friendly amendment to it, asking the state to send 50 highway patrol officers here, at least 50, uh, to work with Memphis police for a period of no less than, than six weeks. Have, has there been a response from, from the state yet? I've personally not received one. I'm sure that Mayor Strickland's administration is in conversation. I've had, I have had conversations with a few chiefs of staff of senior members to see what we can do in the near term. Um, I'm hoping that they will give a formal response. 
But I think what that really demonstrates, though, is that uh, the city of Memphis and Shelby County in general is one of the states, if not the state's largest you know, GDP producer. We have some of the largest private taxpayers in the state. And, and that, from a, if you're a fiscal person um, on the state general assembly, you know, you'd want to protect that cash cow. And so we need help, in particularly when you talk about the interstate shootings, which, you know, we're talking about the violent crime happening in the neighborhoods and we're forgetting that we were had, you know, we had over 40 something interstate shootings last, over the last summer, last year. And so we have to protect that economic commerce that's happening in around I-240 and over and across into Mississippi, the rest of the state of Tennessee and into Arkansas. And I think the state has to play a critical role in that. But I mean, just, I mean, the state promised in its budget, I mean, Bill Lee announced what, 16 highway patrol. Yeah. I'm not putting that on you, but, no, they, but they, they are nowhere to be found. It's frustrating for me. So to that point, the, so to be specific, the governor added an additional 100 highway patrol officers, 25 of which were to be designated is the term I'll use for Shelby County. But the way that the highway patrol works is it's not like the military where you get to pick your assign, I mean, where you get assigned, you get to pick where you want to be assigned and getting officers to want to move, you know, move and be assigned to Shelby County is seemingly a difficult task. Stay on policing. So if the answer is in part policing, and I think you, you know, the, the, the administration had a goal when it came in, when Strickland came in for a first term to get back to something like 2,500 police. We're at 1920, 1950, 1950 give or like take, the Chief Davis uh, told council the other day. I mean, by any measure, hasn't the administration totally failed? I think that, um, I'm sure that there will be people out there that will want to use that word. Um, I think they've had incredible, you know, I'm not here to defend the Strickland administration necessarily, but I think we've seen some tough times. You've got COVID, you've got, you know, George Floyd in the aftermath of all the protests and defunding the police. I mean, every police department around the country lost tens of thousands of officers collectively, and it's become a th almost a thankless job. And as a matter of fact, I'd even add to that, right now we have officers working 16 to 18 hour days. You tell me if you want to get on an airplane with a pilot that's been working 18 hours straight and you're gonna feel safe and that's the quality yeah. that you're getting. And so when we talk about increasing the police force, I mean, it's those, it, it is those things that make it necessary so that we've got the coverage we need with officers that are ready to go, rested and ready for the job. The, um, the other thing that came up, obviously after the, in the unraveling of the, um, the unfolding of the Eliza Fletcher case is that there is a backlog of uh, DNS, DNA, DNA testing of rape kits at the state. Some 600 from across the state, about 300 of those are from Memphis. The other big, uh, about 100, I think it was 170 from Knoxville. Um, people have read those stories. We wrote those stories. But, you know, it, people would likely be alive. If those DNA tests, which 300 sounds like a lot, TBI says it's a lot. I don't know, it doesn't sound like a lot. I mean, that's maybe my personal opinion. And they've got four people doing testing. The state has a surplus. Um, this is, a, I mean, what in the world went wrong with that? And you all talked, I believe, at city council the other day, just, I mean, no decision was made. I mean, is it not time for Memphis just to, and I'll go to you, Ben. I mean, you talked about the business community. I've got to believe there's, there's financial wherewithal and financial support for setting up, if that's gonna save some lives, if that's gonna take some dangerous people off the street, if we're talking about a number in the hundreds that is a backlog that can take up to a nine year, months, they said. nine yeah. months to 11 yeah. months for the one, the I person mean, who is accused of, of abducting no and killing, it makes no sense. So is that the answer? Is that part of the strategy? Memphis, set, Memphis Shelby County set up its own lab to expedite that turnaround? Well, there are a lot of solutions to that. And frankly, that's one of the easier problems that we've heard about. And it just need, takes more money. We need more money. We need to hire the people. You do have to train them. But I think that's, that's just so obvious. It's kind of ridiculous. Can we go back to the more police uh, question sure. you talked yeah. about? Because I think it's important. Chase mentioned we need more visibility. That's really important. It makes people feel safer. And that's true. And we need more police to do the investigation work because we're, we're behind on a lot of that. But we need more police for a lot of other reasons. That uh, MPD gets 975,000 calls a year. They spend almost all their time reacting to calls. You can't reduce crime when all you do is react to calls. We need more police because we need more proactive policing. We need them in the neighborhoods, building relationships, community policing so that the neighborhoods are willing to, to talk to the police and tell them what's going on, find witnesses for things. And then we need them to do Blue Crush, data-driven policing. Data-driven policing is very effective. Uh, that's where you use all the data about what's going on. It's predictive 
and you go to the hot spots. And we don't have enough police to do all that. You talked about uh, data driven. We had uh, uh, CJ Davis, the police chief on the show a month ago, in the last month, talking about all kinds of strategies and talking about the challenges of hiring. People can go to WKNO.org and, the, and, and uh, wherever you get your podcast to get that interview. And it was very interesting about the challenges and getting into that. But one thing she talked about towards the end, and actually I think it might have been off camera because we just didn't get to everything, but we wrote a story about it, is the, the, the cameras. The, the city is filled with these Sky Cop cameras. I think most people, I'm sure, most people will be shocked to know that those blue light cameras are not tied into the police department. They are sort of big videotape cameras. They can be useful. I've talked to you know, the former DA Wyrick. I, I think we talked to D Chief Davis. They can be useful in investigating, reacting is what made me think about it. Chief Davis mentioned... Um, true cameras that are tied in in real time where a shot is fired, the camera zooms in, it comes up at the real time crime center. There are, you know, uh, potentially creepy, but some people would say, I'll take it. Um, reading of license plates that go right to the real time crime center. Those are expensive, but at this point, is it, I'll go to you, Councilman, is it time to just spend the money that it takes to put the technology to be more proactive in how the police? address crime. So uh, the way that I'll answer that question is I think any modern day entity, including police departments, needs to explore all options, including technology on the table in order to be more effective. And especially if we're having trouble hiring officers, getting boots on the ground, then we have to look at alternative uh, technology being one of them. I know you wrote an article about um, uh, spot shotter in Chicago, which shot is some spotter. shot spotter. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. But but yes, I mean, look, not every technology works. Uh, you know, Apple's had pretty, you know, several failed operating systems. And so, but but I am a, a an advocate, um, including tying into business owners' cameras with software patches if they're willing to do that in order to have real time responses. Yeah. And Eric, yeah, and maybe we should add that, you know, uh, there are a lot of other benefits to getting our broadband much stronger. I mean, there's education benefits, health benefits, and public safety benefits if we can take advantage of that dark, you know, the dark fiber and really have a robust uh, broadband component yeah. here in Memphis. Yeah. Let me bring in Bill. I, I think most people's identification with, with, with the Crime Commission is the close eye that the commission keeps on the crime stats from month to month. There, there's a monthly report on this. Um, and Sometimes I, I wonder if we think we're doing better than we are because we see a drop in property crimes or we see a drop in violent crime and everybody goes, oh, okay, the problem's gone away. Um, and, 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 and that doesn't even get into, well, yeah, you know, sexual assaults may be down, but how many are reported in the first place? And that's a big problem with that particular crime, crime, crime category. What from your perspective, what is the value of having those crime statistics uh, in, in, in terms of figuring out where we are and where we need to be with crime? Well, I, I think there is a danger when you look at them over just a short period of time, no doubt. But I think it's very helpful to compare yourself to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when, when we started really keeping these statistics actively since 2006 uh, and, and, and put the emphasis on growing the police force and a lot of other things, our major property crime has gone down consistently that whole period of time until just this year. And that's, people don't realize that. It's our major violent crimes driven mostly by ag assaults that have gone up. They went down till 2011 when we coincidentally had the highest police force we've had. But since 2011, they have just, they've gone up and driven mostly by ag assaults. And so, you can't ignore that ag assaults are driving this, and we've got to do something about that. And frankly, an ag assault with as many guns that are out there is basically just a guy that misses the shot. Yeah. And that's ag assault, it's aggravated assault. Yeah. So aggravated it's assault, aggravated assault, yeah. Because yeah. most of them are with guns now, so yeah. it's a very yeah. dangerous situation. By the way, a, a position permitless carry, I hate, I think constitutional carry is a marketing term, but that, that both the Crime Commission and every legislator in Shelby County was against. Um, we joined our police department. You know, it's created significant policing issues for us. One thing I do want to address in response to last week's segment that I hear very often is a matter of priorities. And, and there's a great talking point in particular from Stan from Children that is, you know, well, our police budgets balloon while neighborhoods and parks. And, and, and the reality is, is yes, it has grown. But if you look at it and you actually really want to dive in the data and get rid of narratives, our police budget grew from 40, 50 percent to, to 68, 69 percent from the 70s to 2010. But it correlates directly with annexation as our 
footprint to 350 square miles got bigger, we needed more officers in order to do that. And our budget as a whole, the operating budget, is 83% personnel expenses. And so when you look at officers that are highly trained, that have, a, or, that have uh, unionized labor uh, or, or associations helping them collect a bargain, you're going to see an uptick in that cost. And so I think it's disingenuous to say that there has been this massive disinvestment in other areas and overinvestment in policing as if we were in a police state. It, it follows the data, and I think it's important to get that out there. So, so how does putting together or augmenting a strategy that's already in place, that, that's the way I'll, I'll, I'll put that. How, how does that work when the Tennessee legislature can do things like open carry, constitutional carry, whatever you want to call it, um, that contravenes one of the key pillars of the strategy here, which is that fewer guns means less violent crime? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing, right? Uh, Wyatt Earp is a famous, you know, romanticized uh, um, h historical character. Uh, but, you know, the way that he saved Dodge City was no firearms in town, right? And so we've almost turned into the Wild West. And, and unfortunately, I don't think we're going to convince our state legislature to, to do away with permitless carry going forward. So much like um, people that are um, um, upset with the Roe v. Wade decision, um, states are going to see, you know, if you've ever read Freakonomics, states are going to see, we saw an influx of guns, you're going to see an influx of adoptions. And so if you're the state government and state legislator that has supported those positions, then you're going to have to pay, bring your checkbook for the resources that these communities are going to need to deal with the consequences of those decisions. In a simple matter, if people are going to carry guns in their cars, we need them to have bolted safes that make it too hard for the criminals, they're not going to fool with the bolted safe. It's only mm -hmm. about 60 bucks. Anybody that has a gun in their car when they go into work and they leave it in their car, they're just asking for it. And, yeah. that, and that's going well, that's all important. over the place. We don't have a single law. I mean, I met with every town. We don't have a single law in the state of Tennessee that defines what securing a firearm in a vehicle means. There is no penalty if you do not, if you put your, if you leave your handgun on the floor of your car and it's stolen and used in the perpetration of a crime, you are not liable as the gun owner for not securing that firearm. Do, do you think that people who buy firearms for protection uh, and who store them in their, in their cars without the kind of lockbox that, that you're talking about, do you think that they correlate those guns being stolen from their cars with the problem we are having with the most violent We crime? know they are. You look, you look at the history of the Castle Doctrine being extended from the home to the vehicle, and I think around 2004, if memory serves me, to today, as it correlates to the amount of guns in, stolen and guns stolen from vehicles, it is, it is astronomical and exponential growth. Uh, in the and guns drives, the street. I mean, I think everyone I mentioned at the top, the 20 law enforcement people we've had on the show, or give or take, over the last year plus, all of them agree, I think. I think every single one of them has agreed with what you're saying. And then it drives all the car break-ins. The auto break-ins are people, you know, when 20 cars or 25 cars in a parking lot broken, they're looking primarily for guns. They're looking and, for guns, yeah. and you're not required to register yeah. that firearm. You're not required to store it. And, and I think it's important, too, to say before everybody on the right gets very upset with me is, I fully believe in the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms. I think the question we should be asking ourselves is in, the, in one of the most developed, civilized nations in the world, why you feel the need that you have to have an AR or, or a handgun to go to the grocery store or fill up with gas. We've got just two and a half, two, two minutes to show here. Um, the other, another thing we've written about and that has been talked about by many, many people who've come on the show is in, I think it was through the end of July, give or take, the 10 divisions of the county criminal courts had finished 32 cases. There is a backlog at that point in time. There's a backlog of around 460, 470 cases. It gets to, I mean, depending on what you think, whether you think all 460 of those cases involve people who are violent criminals who need to go to jail or they're innocent, it serves no one. Uh, I mean, you know, it's almost four years ago to the day, it'll be a couple, another month, that Phil Trenary, who I know both of you worked with closely and knew, was killed. They're, they still haven't gone to trial four years later. You know, so the city doesn't really run the courts, the criminal courts. What, if anything, can be done to find justice for people, to release innocent people, to make the court system go faster? I'll answer quickly because I think this is a great question for, for ben, ben. But I brought this up at the council on Tuesday. You know, we only have a limited scope at city council, although I brought up consolidation often, and this li it lends itself to that. But, but, we, but what we can do is utilize our platform to ask questions about where are, the, where are the gaps in the system and how do we clear those gaps in partnership with the state, federal, and county government. 
And so the, the county commission funds the, the courts. So we need more funding, at least on a temporary basis, and maybe an expedited way to deal with this. And it really is a big problem because th those cases are lasting three or four years before there's a trial. That's not fair to the victims. It's not fair to the defendants. It puts a lot of pressure on the bail system. You right. know, people that are it people the prisons. That, yeah, I mean, it's, who we do it's not know really whether. a terrible situation. And to a lesser extent, we've got the same thing in the federal system because federal laws are tougher on gun crimes. And we like to use the federal laws because they're tougher. But the federal system can't handle all of the potential cases that we have for them. Yeah. Um, we've referenced, again, if you came late today, we've referenced last week's show. We had Josh Pickler from Just City, Cardell Oren from uh, Stanford Children, Tennessee, uh, the Reverend Ayanna uh, Watkins, executive director of MICA. And, you know, I, I don't want to share my opinion. Really, there is a lot of commonality in what, and we talked about this before about, you know, and even um, and Josh Pickler, who's working on the transition with the new DA, Steve Mulroy, talked about, look, Mulroy's going to use everything at his disposal to put, to, 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 to prosecute these people in these most recent claims. They're talking about bigger picture, long-term things. So again, it, for people who want the other side of this, please go to WKNO.org to get that uh, past show. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Bill. Tune in again next week. Thanks.